You know, if you got Olympic fever today, we're talking with a two-time gold medalist and one of the most accomplished female athletes in the world. That's next on Significant Insights. Hello and welcome to the program. You know, with the Summer Olympics only a few days away, millions of people around the world are going to be watching the games played out this year in Rio de Janeiro. That's why today we're featuring an interview with an Olympian, Ruthie Bolton. Her list of accomplishments and all of her awards are so long that I only have time to hit the highlights. Ruthie has won two Olympic gold medals as part of the United States women's basketball team, first in Atlanta, 1996, and then in Sydney, Australia in 2000. She's led many of her teams to championships and she was the first female player of the United States national team to have her number retired. But it will be surprising to learn that Ruthie's journey includes being told, you can't do it before every major milestone of her athletic career. Though in high school she won two state championships, she wasn't recruited by any college. Her older sister, Maola, played for Auburn, and though they offered Ruthie a scholarship, they told her that she really wasn't good enough to play basketball for them and that she would likely spend the year on the bench. Well, we begin our conversation with Ruthie on the bus to Auburn. Your sister uh, ended up getting a scholarship to, mm -hmm. uh, to Auburn, and if I understand the story, in order to get her, they had also promised to take yes. care of you. Yes. And so when you went to Auburn, they said, well, you're never really going to play for Auburn. Exactly. How, how did that make you feel? You know, at the time, it was like, it was, it was hard. It was like, man, you, I felt like the situation was trying to take my dream away. I remember that was the longest ride back home because I rode the bus there. <laughs> had I not gotten on that bus, and I remember my dad telling me this like it was yesterday. He said, if you don't get on that bus, you always wonder what if. Because I'm thinking, I'm already thinking that there's a obstacle against me because yeah. they want me, they flew my sister and they want me to ride a bus, so I'm already knowing I'm not as important. But it's, but my dad said, you know what, in life, that door, that door may close, but you still have that window of opportunity. And so I got on that bus and just sitting there, just thinking, okay, my dad encouraged me and pushed me. He didn't make a decision for me. He said, if you don't want to play, you don't have to play. But he said, I, I believe if you turn this down, you'll regret it later. Because sometimes, yeah. you know, when you need people around you that, that sort of believe in you, sometimes when you're a little bit skeptical, and not sure you need people to invest in you and pour into you. And my dad really poured into all of us. So what happened? You know, they, they basically were very discouraging. Very. But I, I just, my dad, I was just so determined. I, I feel like there was so much more basketball left in me. And so I, I went and I took my chance. So how long did it take before they began to say, whoa, wait a minute, maybe. About, about eight weeks, about a couple of months. Really? It was a sense of urgency in my mind. I knew when I got there, they already thinking I'm not, I'm not going to play, but I love this game so much. So if the coach said I do 25 push-ups, I did 35. If we did a suicide, you know, we sprint. I don't know if you know what a suicide is. You go no, here, no, here, no. here. It's like everybody, oh, that's the worst sprint in basketball. If, he, if the guards had to do it in 27 seconds, I try to do it in 25. Everything we did, I try to exceed. And I, t I tell my coach, you know, I just saw him recently, and I'm like, coach, thank you for challenging me. Thank you for telling me that I wasn't good enough because that, that – forced me to rise, that forced me to, you know, could adversity make you bitter or make you better? So it forced me to rise and, and dig deep, or, you know, I, I would've just walked away. And so I, I, I told him I'm thankful, you know, he actually wrote the foreword to my book, The Ride of a Lifetime. And, it, it, you know, he said, man, who would ever, when that day I saw you, and someone had told me one day you would be a two-time Olympian, you know, playing two world championship, be a four-time Hall of Famer, I would've told him they was crazy. It really is a testament to, you know, termination and having that support, having someone to believe in you. And, and, and I don't, I think about, I don't know if I could have really traveled down that road without my father's guidance because everybody say go down the road, let's travel. That's yeah. easier said than done. When you finished up with, uh, with your college basketball, is that when you went immediately then to the uh, Olympic team? One thing about playing for the USA, you have, to, you have to get in a pool of players. You know, there's very few players go straight from college to yeah. the Olympics, and so there's a process. You know, you play in the World University game, 
then you play in a couple select, you know, Goodwill. And so then you eventually get to the Olympics. And so, so they just sort of yeah, start calling out the, exactly, but, the other but, players but so I they come up with an Olympic team. They come up with a pool of players. Back then it was like 50, and I didn't get invited. It was like we just You're made kidding. It. No, we made after, it. After the I'll, retired jersey at Auburn, I mean, yeah. every, everywhere you went, yeah. you had to reprove yourself. I, had, I did. It's like they had to. It was weird. I'm like, and I was surprised that I didn't get um, – Invited, at least invited, just saying we're gonna invite you and we're gonna look at you. It's not a promise. It's just like okay, so it was tough, and I had, but I, you know what? But that there was that door closing, but the window was me paying my own way. You know, once I got when I went, to, I paid my own way to go to this trial. 165 girls, but it was 50 they invited, but they only gonna pick two teams, about 24 players, give or take. So there was 165 girls fighting for 24 spots. What what was it like when you were announced that you were part of the team? Man, it was. It was just like, it was almost surreal. It's like, man. But it was just, it was such like, man, I was like, for once, and Lord, thank you for allowing this. Thank you for allowing me to show up because, and not stay home, the fear of what if I don't get picked? And that's what my dad instilled in me. You never know, don't ever live, a, you, live you live a life of regrets when you let people control your destiny, control who you are, and try to dictate where you're going. He said, you, you got to take charge and you got to, you know, so what if you make a mistake? You just said something that, I, that is, is part of my life philosophy. Mm -hmm. I've got three things. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I was talking about this and said, on my headstone, I want these three things. Honor God, mm -hmm. work hard, keep showing up. That's right. And mm -hmm. that's what you did. You just kept it, showing up. Exactly. You uh, won your first gold medal. Mm -hmm. Uh, standing on that platform had yeah. to be an incredible experience. In Atlanta, yes. In Atlanta, it was, I, you know, I heard the national anthem. I sang it a lot with my teammates, and it was something about that moment to hear it. The words sound different. It was just a whole different, it was just beautiful. And you stand on the podium, and your, your flag goes up higher than everybody else. And every, my whole life flashed before me, the struggles of what I had gone through, and like, man, I'm glad I got on that bus. You know, I'm glad that, that I didn't quit. That eight-hour trip back home. Yeah, with, yeah. Mm. I'm glad I, you know, paid my own way to the trials. You know, I'm glad I didn't live, like I didn't sit there and come, you know, oh, poor me. I just, my dad just encouraged me. So it just, it was just beautiful. And to represent not only my family, but my whole city, United States of America, they were dependent on us. And we came through. The next time you got your gold medal, yeah. Just Actually, in 96, what I did with my medal, I gave it to my sister. My dad was there. My mom had passed, unfortunately, at that time, but he had a picture of my mom. So after I came out the podium, I went over and hugged my dad and, you know, and hugged my sister, and I gave her my, my medal. Because wow. she's always a dream. She would always want to go to the Olympics. She would go to a lot of different trials and never, every time she'd come back, I didn't make it, I did good, but, but, I, but when I made it, I felt like I owed it to her to share that with her. Ruthie's basketball career was skyrocketing, but at the same time, she was hiding a very dark secret about her marriage. We'll talk about that when we come back. You know, my, my, pers my basketball career was going great. In my personal life, I just couldn't get a grasp on it. And I just felt like, you know, I don't know. I, I, all that stuff don't matter. It didn't matter if I couldn't fix home. Welcome back. Today, athlete Ruthie Bolton has been telling us the highlights of her stellar basketball career, which includes two Olympic gold medals. But even as she was aiming high and scoring often against her rivals on the basketball court at home, well, she was facing a different kind of opponent altogether. What uh, most people didn't know about Ruthie Bolton, with all of the fame, with all of the success, with all the fortune, there was something else very dark going on in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, domestic abuse. Tell me about it. Yeah, it was, um, I don't know, it was tough. You know, I was, I felt like I had um, met the man of my dream and, um, and I just, I didn't know, I didn't know a lot about relationships. I didn't know I, he was my first and, and when it, um, when the domestic violence, when it started, I was confused, but I felt like, you know what, I can, you know, in my career, as we talked about, I had. I can work hard enough I, to overcome Oh yeah, I, I feel like my strength became my weakness, my fight and my determination and not quitting. You know, I can do this. I'm like, I, I know how to get results. If I work harder, 
no matter the harder you get, the harder the resistance, the harder I'm gonna push. And so that's what I did. And I just felt like, you know, every day, and I'm optimistic that every day is a new day. It's a new opportunity. So now I can do this. And, and every episode that I would go through, you know, I felt like, you know what, it was the last time. And I felt like that that it was going to be okay. And I said, I'm going to look back and say, you know what, I fought hard. You think maybe that's what happens with a lot of women, <clears throat> that they think we can correct this? Because usually in domestic abuse, the husband is abusive and then he's very apologetic. Very, yeah. He's sorry that it happened. It's mm -hmm. never going to happen again. And then it happens again. Uh, and he's sorry. And so from what I have read, the woman kind of gets trapped in this confusion it's, of the good guy to the bad so, guy. Because when you vision, like I vision this is the man I'm gonna marry, be married forever, have my kids by, and I'm not a quitter. I don't care what people say, this is our journey, this is our what we're going through, and we're gonna fight. You know, I'm 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 up I know I know how to make things right. And I, you know as a woman we, we nurture and we wanna fix things and we wanna make it right. And so we feel like, you know what, I, I can do this. I, I can make this work. I just gotta hang in there. Did you ever feel like it was your fault? Me? Yeah. Oh, that yeah. it was the abuse was your fault, that maybe you were doing something wrong as a wife or you didn't measure up as a wife and yes. that was causing this abuse? Yes, I definitely felt like that. I felt like, you know, just you know, I would even go and make groceries and, and forget an ingredient and like forget one and, and that would be yeah. and I felt like, man, how could I, you know, as a if I'm a wife, how could I forget, you know, to get cheese if I'm making, you know, tacos or how could I forget so I was always blaming myself and so that's why I feel like it was me if I can make this right if I can just get better at this and I remember my one of my good friends we used to work out together and I just said I'm a terrible wife I just can't I can't make him happy you know he come home if I'm you know if I cook chicken he wanted a piece of I had pizza he wanted chicken yeah. so I couldn't I felt like it just was so you know my my person my basketball career was going great in my personal life I just couldn't get a grasp on it and I just felt like, you know, I don't know. I, it, all that stuff don't matter. It didn't matter if I couldn't fix home. And so I just felt like sometimes I didn't even deserve to win. A lot of times in situations like this, somebody comes along that suddenly is understanding, uh, <clears throat> offers a lot of consolation mm -hmm. and relationships develop. And that's what happened to you, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it was <clears throat> the most very, um, all the, the things that he, would, my ex, would call me and say, the things he would, the names, and I felt like, but when when I finally, when I ended up in another relationship, I felt like that maybe I deserved that, and I and I I was living with fear and guilt, and I felt like at this point, if the, if it kills me, I have to stay here. I can't go anywhere because I have to fix what I've messed up, and so it was just like. So uh, through all of this. Um, <clears throat> It practically destroyed your own self-image, even though it did. as successful as you were, yeah, it did. two I, gold medals, professional basketball player, uh, and yet you took all of the responsibility for this and all of the guilt. What finally happened? I lived through a lot of fear, and I started thinking about what if I had a what if I had a, a daughter, or what if someone, my niece, someone that I love more than myself, because I didn't, I had lost my confidence as a woman. And so, but sitting someone in that chair that I felt like that I love more than myself, that what made me realize like, wow, how could I see someone that I truly love go through what I went through? And so that what made me finally leave. But even after I left <clears throat> and I was in California and he was back there, I still, we separated for a year. And then even after I was still wanting to go back, I still in my mind from 202 we, we divorced but up to like 206, 207, I was still, at any moment, we could get on the flight and go back. It was wow. so hard for me to break away. Did your husband, uh, your former husband, ever try to deal with his problem, or did he ever admit he had a problem? You know what, it's real ironic that I probably like a week ago, he called me and told me he's sorry. And I had wa I've been wanting to hear that for the longest, but he, every, the time I would talk to him, he would, he would always say it was my fault, but he finally said, you know, I'm sorry for everything. And I wanted to talk to him more because it's like, but he was like, no, I'm good. And he just said goodbye. Yeah. How are you able to help other women who yeah, are in domestic exactly. abuse to as a, a result of what you went through? Yeah, you know what, just really, you know, I tell women, I, I know I did a WNBA tour speaking to the different teams. And 
you know, I say, you know what? One main thing that I've learned from this is that I've, I've totally forgiveness, no resentment. You know, I, um, you know, I've, I always call and encourage him to, you know, move, you know, to do. I always ask him how you doing and want the best for him, and and still. So I said, but make sure you don't go around with that unforgiveness in your heart because it's gonna still eat at you. But I want to be a voice for these women that may be afraid. And since then, a lot of women have come to me, sent me emails. You know, and say, you know what? Thank you for giving me closure. Thank you for helping me feel like I'm not alone. Yeah. And so, if you know, it was worth. If, if one woman could get out of a situation because of me sharing my story, it's worth it. Because you live in fear. I live in fear and guilt, and that could have that could have taken my life. You got a lot of women that stay there because of a guilt, and they never got out. So you might. I don't know. God bless me. He allowed me to. So get out. you've dealt with it. Your past. Yeah, I'm, the yeah. guilt and the lack of self-esteem yeah. and seeing who you are as a person. Uh, tell me about your foundation, Aim High. Yeah, uh, it's Aim High. You know, I work with a lot of kids, and I, I, I love basketball, you know, obviously, but it's not just a basketball. You still shoot hoops occasionally? I do. I play in some three-on-threes. <laughs> and uh, Aim High, it, it, it's, it's, at the, it's an after-school program that I call them as Aim High curriculum and also my basketball program. And it's saying Aim Higher. If you're going to make it in life, you got to aim higher than this frustration, this disappointment. You gotta aim higher than all the setbacks, and you gotta, no matter how tough a situation gets, there is something greater. And that's something my dad taught me too. He said, if you fall down and break one leg, be thankful. I'm like, okay, because you could have broke two. You know, <laughs> there's all he was so positive. You know, he, and he always talked about, you know, life is. Um, if you're taking life, it's life is ten percent of what happens to you, but nine percent how you respond to it. So that's what this program does. Aim high. We teach basketball, but it's is rebuilding lives through sports, using sports as a platform, but trying to teach them about life skills, about attitudes, about setting goals and not quitting. And so in my book, The Ride of a Lifetime, that I wrote about three years ago, it pretty much my program on wheels. I travel and speak, and I'm currently working on a journal called Journey With Me. And this is really, it was like my, it was, it was just, I, I was one of my, I wanted to do it. It kept, I was like, I gotta do it. And it's just journaling with teenagers, just starting off asking them questions about their goals and their dreams. The, quali the, the positive qualities they possess, um, things they fear, just asking questions that generally maybe teenagers don't get asked, and I'm holding their hand, walking through this journey with them, and saying, you can do it, you can do it. And the and, and latter part of this journey, I saw a let go, and I'm, I'm giving them permission to dream. This is your dream, now you can believe, you can go to that college. Maybe no one in your family graduated, but you can still go you know, to that college. No one, you know, you can still play in the uh, WNBA, you can play in the NBA, you can go to, you know, you can do whatever you wanna do, pursue, excellence and it's a mindset you have the ability you have the right to go for what you want not based on your circumstances and then at the end of this journal they have to sign their name and date it it may take one person two weeks it may take another one two months when you're done you're ready you sign it i commit to my journey i'm embracing my journey the good the bad the ups and the downs is that this is mine and that's what i want kids to get from that we appreciate ruthie's openness about uh well such a sensitive topic if you're the victim of domestic violence, please do not stay silent and please seek help immediately. In Illinois, you can contact Pastor Karen Brewer, herself a domestic abuse survivor. You can contact her at Atonement Covenant Church at 1-773-483-4780. And I want you to know that any messages left will be confidential and they will, will go directly to Pastor Brewer. In the San Francisco Bay Area for help, you can call the ministry La Casa de las Madres at 1-877-503-1850. Final thoughts about domestic violence right after this. We look in scripture and we find the same patterns we see today. We find the pattern of, uh, of a woman who is uh, abused at the hands of a man. Welcome back. You know, throughout Ruthie Bolton's marriage, she didn't tell anybody about the abuse she had suffered, but this is not uncommon. Victims of abuse are often helped when people give them a voice and speak out in support of them. Last year, shortly after running back Ray Rice was seen on camera knocking out his girlfriend in a hotel elevator, we recorded these thoughts from Pastor Mike Neal. 
pastor of Word and Worship Christian Church in Sugar Grove, Illinois, and they're really relevant to our program today. In the conversation about domestic violence against women, we find a pattern uh, that is not new, uh, but it's a biblical pattern. It's been in Scripture. This has been a problem all along. This didn't begin with the recent headlines about um, the man who beat his wife in an elevator, but rather it's been a problem for a long time. We look in Scripture and we find the same patterns we see today. We find the pattern of, uh, of a woman who is uh, abused at the hands of a man. We find the pattern of uh, the voice of the woman being taken away. We find the pattern of the conversation being such that she is completely removed from the conversation and the dialogue and the battle goes on between the men. We find that both in, the, in, the, in today's stories and in the biblical story. We look at the story of Tamar where she is raped by her half-brother in 2 Samuel 13. She's raped and, and afterwards she disappears. Her voice is taken away. Her brother who comes to aid her says, uh, don't say a word. Don't take this to heart. Don't say a word. And he silences her. And then she disappears from the picture. And the rest of the conversation is about Absalom and Amnon fighting against each other for the throne of David. David, the father, who himself had done the similar thing with Bathsheba and had her husband killed. So he's silent, says nothing, and the brothers battle. Today we have the same story. We have a, a young woman. Ray Rice beats his girlfriend in an elevator. And the conversation we hear for weeks after is not about her. No one cares about her, about her child, about how they have to see this over and over and over on television. But the conversation is now between Roger Goodell, who is the man in charge, he's the king, and Ray Rice, who is the son. And so she's silenced and she's powerless. And we have a situation where no one comes to aid her and the little aid she gets silences her and takes her power away. And so I want to encourage us to look at this story Take some time and study the story on your own and relate it to the life, relate it to, relate it to current stories. And be a voice. More importantly, be a presence. With those who have been hurt and have been abused, be a presence. Oftentimes they have the strength and they have the courage and they have the voice to express themselves. Tamar was logical. Tamar was strong. Tamar was courageous. In the midst of all that, read the story for yourself. She was strong and courageous. She was more like a king than either of the, of the king's sons or the king. Yet she was silenced. And what, what victims need is our presence. And so learn to be a presence with someone who's hurt. Don't try to fix it. And whatever you do, don't silence them. Be a voice. Speak out. But don't speak over the voice of the person who is the victim of the situation. Don't ignore the fact that the person who is hurt has a right to be heard. Uh, we can't fix everything, but we can be a powerful presence with those who are hurt. Stand up, stand out, don't be silent, don't sit on the sidelines. The church is not called to sit this one out. The church is called to stand up and be a part of the solution. So be a part of the solution, be prayerful, right now for all of those who have been victims of violence, domestic, domestic violence. Be prayerful for them. Be a presence for them. Bring the power of God into their situation. You know, one of the things that I think is really notable about uh, Ruthie Bolton and what really made her a champion is not only did she overcome the discouragers in her life, she also overcame the domestic violence. She did something about it. And I appreciate the words of uh, Pastor Neil. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. The world is full of discouragers. The one thing that made a huge difference in Ruthie Bolton's life was her father who was an encourager. And I think today, if I have a choice, I want to be an encourager. And I would, I would really suggest that you do the same thing. Find somebody special in your life and be an encourager to that person it'll make a big difference. Thanks for joining us.